Hello, beloved. It's good to be with you. And uh, once again, for us to do some Bible study, we're looking at the privileges of believers or privileges of saints. And this is already part five. Amazing. Uh, to, to go through what the scriptures teaches us about our privileges that we have because we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we continue, though, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it's such a privilege to come to you as in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is our advocate, our mediator. Thank you, Father, that we can come to you, to your throne of grace, with boldness in his name. We want to pray, Father, that you will please open up your word to us so that we may understand, take it to heart, and apply it in our lives so that you may be glorified in and through our lives. Thank you for all the privileges that you give us as believers. And this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Now, we we looked at some privileges last week. We looked at, uh, we have the privilege to have Jesus Christ as our shepherd. And we also looked at the privilege of believers to have Christ as intercessor, a mediator, and advocate. Those were some of the privileges that we looked at last week. Now, today we're going to look at the privileges that we have as believers. Specifically, the first one is with regards to the promises of God that we receive. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, we read, Therefore, Having these promises, see those words, therefore having these promises, those are promises that we have received from God. And when you go back, this is now in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 to uh, one and 2, but when you go back to chapter 6, we actually see what those privileges are. Okay, in verse 16, we read in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, it says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, and, and this is now the Apostle Paul laying the foundation so that the Corinthian believers can understand that they, they are the temple of the Holy, Sp- uh, Holy Spirit, the temple of God, and they cannot be involved in idol worship and doing things with the idols and doing it for God because the body is basically a temple of the living God. Now he says, what agreement does the temple of God have um, of God with, with idols? Or uh, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Amazing words. So I will dwell in them and walk among them. That just means so much. We have the promise that God will come and dwell in our midst. He will be, his presence will be with us. Now remember, when the temple was still there, God's presence, his Shekinah glory was in the most holy place of the temple. But after uh, the temple was destroyed, after Jesus died and rose again and ascended to heaven and the temple was destroyed, what happened was at the day of Pentecost, that was actually quite a bef- uh, time before the temple was destroyed, but um, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, God's presence came to dwell in us, in the believer. All right, that's not no longer among us, it is in us. So the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. His presence is now in us. All right, so I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wow, look at those promises. Isn't that amazing? All right, so God will come and indwell us. He will come and dwell within us. The third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, will come and live within believers. And then he says, and I will be their God. Okay, obviously he was speaking to the to, to the Jews at that specific stage. But remember that Paul is speaking here to the Corinthian believers, and they are Gentiles. Because we have now, through faith in Jesus Christ, even the Gentiles are now included in the promises that God made to Israel. One, one thing that we need to understand is we do not replace Israel. Israel doesn't just fall away and all of a sudden disappears. And the promises of Israel becomes our promises. And now we can walk around as, as the Gentile church with, 
and, and we can boast about the fact that Ooh, we have now the promises of Abraham. That's true, we do have it. But it doesn't mean that Israel do not mean anything to God anymore. All right. So even though this is Old Testament, the, the reality is that God will come and indwell us. He said to Israel he's going to do that. What happened on the day of Pentecost? That's exactly what God did. God the Holy Spirit came and indwelled the believers. Who were the believers? Jews. That's who they were. They were Jews who came to faith in Jesus Christ at that specific day. Those who followed Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit came and indwelled them. All right. So is this promise that this promise come into fulfillment? Did it happen to the Jews? Yes, it happened in Jerusalem. So I will dwell in them. God did it through the uh, when the Holy Spirit came and indwelled the believers. And I will walk among them, which means God's presence will now be among his people. And, and why? Because he indwells them. All right. And then I will be their God. Is God the God of those that he indwells? Obviously he is. And they shall be my people. All right. So whoever God indwells, those people will be his people. Wow. What a promise. Then verse 17, uh, he says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. The Lord says that he will receive his own. Okay. And they will come out among what? They will come out from among the, the, uh, the world, not from among those who are unsaved. And they will be the people of God. And God's people uh, will not then touch what is not acceptable to God because they want to live holy lives. And God says he will receive them. Then he says, I will be a father to you, which means that there's another promise. God will be a father to those that he saves, basically. Amazing. Those that he indwells, he will be a father to them. And they shall be my sons and daughters, the text tells us. So we become, and that's part of the promises of God. Eh? We become the daughters and sons of the Almighty God. This is just absolutely amazing. And now John, um, Paul goes on in, in verse 1 of chapter 7 of Second Corinthians. And he says, therefore... Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And this is just absolutely amazing. Therefore, because we have these promises, because God will walk, um, how can I say, come and indwell us and be among us, that uh, he will be our God, we will be his people, that he will receive us, that he will be our father, that we will be his sons and daughters. Because of these promises, Paul comes and he says to the Corinthian believers, Now, beloved, because, therefore, having these promises, these promises that has just been given in chapter 6, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What should our our, our what should be the outcome if we understand what God's promises are and that we are partakers of his promises, that he has actually, how can I say, we have the privilege to have these promises. It is ours now. And what should the outcome be? What, what, what should happen because we have these promises? It's kind of obvious where Paul says, having these promises, beloved, the consequence of this should be that we cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Why? Because we have all these promises. And why would we want to have these promises and still continue to be dirty, still continue to live like the world, still continue to do the kind of things that we used to do when we were still in the world, when we were living according to the flesh and under the power of Satan? Why, why do we want to continue with those things? No, no, that's not what we want to do. We should cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Why? Because we have these promises. These things are all ours. 
which means that in our actions we should live holy lives we should reflect what it means to be a child of god we should act and that's something that is important for believers amazing absolutely a wonderful amazing passage of scripture now in second peter chapter 1 verse 4 we read the following uh, maybe we should read verse 3 as well second peter chapter 1 verse 3 says as his divine power has given to us all things that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue just by his divine power he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness beloved it is just so amazing and that kind of connects into the fact that we are indwelt by the holy spirit god the holy spirit dwells within us and it's god the holy spirit who enables us to to live the kind of lives that is pleasing to him and that we can be godly now that we can pursue godliness with with everything that is in us the holy spirit enables us to do that that's what uh, peter says in second peter chapter 1 verse 3 in verse 4 says uh, say, he says uh, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises all right so we have received all these amazing promises why because god the spirit dwells within us and he has given us all things okay so we have these exceedingly great and precious promises that though these uh, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature so we have all these promises that points to this one thing that we will be indwelled by the holy spirit it's the rebirth now when we are born again and the holy spirit comes and dwells within us and obviously we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust this is just so amazing all right so we become partakers of the divine nature in the sense that the holy spirit comes and indwells us that is part of the promise that that god gives us part of the promises that we receive the privileges that we receive as believers that we have these promises that comes from god and because god is the one who promised these things he will also make sure that it happens beloved and that's so amazing that's absolutely absolutely amazing right another privilege that we as believers have is that we have possession of all things we read that in first corinthians chapter 3 first corinthians chapter 3 uh, and it's in verse 21 to verse 23 it says therefore let no one boast in men for all things are yours verse 22 whether paul or apollos or cephas or the world or life or death or present uh, things present or things to come all are yours and you are christ christ's and christ is god's ah, amazing words these all right so he, he says in verse 21 let no one boast in men for all things are yours so what happened in the in the Corinthian church was that factions developed. Nah? Some people would say, no, I'm of Paul. Others would say, no, I'm of Apollos. Others would say, no, I'm of Cephas. And then others again would say, no, I'm of Christ. And, and because they were following um, all these different groups developed, uh, we, we see that the Corinthian church were, were plagued by division. All right, they couldn't they, they couldn't be unity because of these groups that developed so everyone kind of got their favorite teacher and they started following that favorite favorite teacher and uh, it caused a disunity among the people of God all right so Paul says therefore let no one boast in men okay for all things are yours don't boast in men D don't don't take pride in the fact that oh i belong to paul and i belong to uh, apollos oh i belong to cephas no they mere men they are men that god uses to to basically bring the gospel to you it wasn't these men who built the church it is jesus christ himself who builds the church okay 
there, there's no reason to boast about some of these leaders that was in the church. Because they had nothing to do with the building of the church. Yes, they laid the foundation. They were busy building the uh, laying the foundation, but it's Christ who built his church. Okay? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's Jesus who builds the church. All right. So whether people follow Paul or Apollos or or, or Cephas, that, that, that means nothing. They are just co-workers. They are people who are busy doing what God wants them to do. It is God that is in control. It's Christ who builds his church. Right. At the end of the day, Actually, all believers sharing God's provision. We all sharing God's glories. Okay? So we don't have to boast in men, boast in mere people, for all things are ours. And that's the promise. That's the that's the privilege that we have as believers, is that we we <laughs> yo, we we at the end of the day. We, we have all things that is necessary. Let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, says the Apostle Paul. Okay? There is not a thing that is not ours. Everything is ours. Okay, later on in another text, uh, we actually learn what it, what it actually means. Nah. All right. But then it's interesting what it says. That you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Ha <laughs> ha. That's so beautiful. That at the end of the day, all believers belong to Christ. Whether they are teachers in the church or whether people would put them on a pedestal and, and kind of start just following their teachers. No, at the end of the day, all believers belong to Christ. And we belong to each other. Because we equal before, before Christ. We are saved the same way. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. All right. And therefore, we should actually be united. The unity we have is the fact that we are all sinners saved by grace. All sinners. So we are supposed to, that, that's supposed to unite us, not bring the vision because the one follows this leader and the other one follows another leader and the other one follows another. That's not the way it's supposed to work. All right. See, we have the privilege that all things, I'm going to say that we are, we have all the possessions that we need. All things that we need. Okay? All things. We have possession of all things that is necessary to live the kind of lives that is pleasing to God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And, and that called, those who are called according to his purpose, that, that call is the effectual call of God. That's the, that's the call. That's, that's, the, that's when God calls his own to himself. And then they hear his voice and they start following him. All right, that's the call that he, speak, he is speaking about in this passage. All right. Or in this verse. And it's interesting. It says, and we know that all things work together for good. Some of the better man manuscripts actually reads as follows. It says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good uh, to those who love God. God causes it. You see, it, this is kind of part of God's providence, isn't it? When we talk about God being in control of all things, it is part of God's providence. God is the one who is in control of all things. He orchestrates every event in our lives in accordance to His providence. He is in control. We might think, oh, no, yo, this is just chance. No, there is no such thing as chance. Things happen on purpose. God is in control of all those things. All right? And, and the reason for that is because He is... On the present, he is almighty. He has full control. He's the potter. Uh, he has, he, he, it speaks about God's providence. Okay, God is sovereign in every aspect of life. Do we understand exactly how it works? No, we don't. I don't. Maybe there are people that understand. I don't. I, I accept what the scripture teaches about God's providence. There's some things that I would say, you know what? Um, if I had to say that God orchestrates every event in my life, 
even the suffering and the temptation and the sin to kind of accomplish our temporal or my temporal and eternal benefit. I don't know how that works. It works like that. Obviously, it says, and that's why uh, Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are uh, the called according to His purpose. When God places that effectual call on a believer or a sinner and God calls that person to repentance, the person hears the voice of God and then reacts and gets um, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And, and it is God who works all things together for good. So whatever happens in that person's life, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter how good it is or how bad it is, God will use all of that to, to basically work in accordance to His purpose. So even the bad things that happens to us, the negative things to us, the things that we do where we sin against God, God will use all those things to fulfill His purposes and His plans because He is ultimately in control to... Uh, of the direction and where he wants everything to go and he will work it out according to the way that he wants it to work out and and it doesn't matter what we do god is not caught on uh, god of guard and, and once again i spoke about this before the wonderful thing is that god is outside of time and space now god is outside of our time he knows my death bef- um, and and my birth at the same time so whatever I do during my life, God knows exactly what I'm going to do now. God knows what I did in the past and God knows what I'm going to do in the future all at the same time. So he cannot be caught off guard because his purposes will be fulfilled. And the reason why his purposes will be fulfilled is because he uses all things. All right. Every single aspect of our lives um, to make sure that it works together for our good. But it's our good in in I can say in line with his purpose and his plan. So things that works out for our good is always directed at exactly how it fits into God's purposes and his plans. It's not just, oh, don't worry about the pain you're going through and the suffering you're going through. All things work together for good. No, no, no. That's not the way we look at things. We I know that whatever I'm going through now is going to work in a in accordance to God's purpose and God's plan. That's the way I look at these things. All right. So, but we have this wonderful privilege to be, uh, how can I say, to, to have all things work together for good. That's the promise that God gives us. That's our privilege. And then we have the privilege to have possession of all things. Those are just two more privileges that we as believers have. Oh, it's just absolutely, absolutely amazing. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come to you in Jesus' precious name. And thank you for your love and kindness towards us. Thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. Thank you for all the privileges that we have. Wow, it's so amazing. Uh, May those privileges that we have burn into our hearts so that we may understand what you have done for us. And Father, may our lives reflect the gratitude and thankfulness that we have for what you have accomplished in our lives, on our behalf, in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Right, beloved, thank you very much for listening. Uh, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he give you his peace. God willing, until we speak again, bye-bye.